Manhattan, New York. Did you know Soho used to be called Hell's 100 Acres? During the Depression, it used to house the poor and destitute of New York. Not the glamorous clinking of glasses, heels, and Instagram pics like it is now. Under that dazzling skyline, there lies a dark underbelly. Let's backtrack to the 1800s. This violent tale is all about Levi Weeks, the younger brother of Ezra Weeks, who, in the 1800s, was one of New York's most famous builders. I'm sure you've walked past this Soho location, 129 Spring Street, in search of a new bar, not knowing the details of the tragic young woman's death or the U.S. court history involved, as this was the first ever court-recorded murder case in U.S. history. It's even mentioned in the recent musical, Hamilton. Levi was born in 1776 in Greenwich, Massachusetts. Now, this was a very small town. A super fun fact is that H.P. Lovecraft based his fictional town from the Dunwich Horror partially on Greenwich. If you were planning on visiting, it would require a boat since the town's actually been a reservoir since the 1930s. However, in 1798, Levi moved from Greenwich to New York to be with his successful older brother, Ezra. Ezra was an interesting man in his own right. He'd managed to align himself quickly with the wealthy and powerful of New York City. He worked on buildings that are still very much visible today, such as Gracie Mansion, which is the official residence of the New York mayor. But back to Levi. He's a handsome, young, single man at the age of 22, fresh-faced in New York City and working as a carpenter with a very successful older brother. Life was good for these guys, mixing in all the right circles and going to all the great parties. But enter into the equation Guillelma Elma Sands. From this moment, Levi's life would never be the same. Elma, as she was called by her friends, had no social connections. She had nothing to do with the wealthy or the elite of Manhattan society. So how did Levi and Elma get involved? In 1799, Elma arrived in New York to live with her Quaker relatives, Catherine and Elias Ring. The Rings ran a boarding house, and since New York was such a fast-growing city, accommodation was snapped up very quickly. It wasn't long before Elma and Levi began a quiet affair. This relationship was not just about sitting and reading to one another, if you know what I mean. As the relationship progressed, it was clear that Elma was absolutely smitten by her secret boyfriend. She had been declaring their love and intent to marry to her friends and family. She knew that once he made it official and proposed, her life would finally be on the right path. However, the problem is, she was poor, and Levi was always seen out and about with his brother Ezra, mixing with the wealthy and elite. But who knows what was really going on in his mind? According to Elma, on December 22nd, they eloped. Elma had already told her cousin, Catherine Sands, that they were to be married that night. Dressed in her best clothes, wrapped up warm and excited to begin her new life, Elma walked off into the cold night air. She would never be seen alive again. On January 2nd, 1800, two young boys were playing around the well in what is now Soho, the Manhattan Well, when they saw a piece of clothing floating in the well. Police were notified and the well was dragged. They found the body of Elma, her young body marked with bruises and scratches, and it was clear that this beautiful woman had met a horrible end. It wasn't long before the police had arrested and charged Levi Weeks for the murder of Elma. Now, big brother Ezra steps in. Now, he has power on his side, and he doesn't muck around. He hires the top lawyers in town, Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton. It is the ones you're thinking of from The Hamilton Show. They will now represent Levi in the first recorded murder trial in the United States. The case was pure substantial evidence. The relationship had been kept quiet. No one had seen Levi with Elma that night. Elma had been at a party at the boarding house and left alone. Levi was said to be with his brother. If we dig a bit deeper, there were apparently multiple sources that placed Levi and Elma walking in the woods near the well, or that a man in Ezra's horse-drawn cart was seen near the well, or that the couple had been seen walking in the woods. Aside from all the speculation on the couple, by the time the trial date arrived, Elma's family had created a frenzy in New York. This murder was huge news and her family had made sure everyone knew about it. They had embarked on vengeance threats and had even displayed Elma's body 
for the public to see. It reached such a point that even Levi's landlord said he would gun him down if he saw him. This trial needed top lawyers, and that's what Ezra delivered. The New York public opinion had already decided that Levi was as evil as the devil. To discredit Elma, Hamilton and Burr painted a different picture, and that was Levi had never actually desired to marry Elma. They were simply enjoying something for what it was, but it would never result in marriage. Upon hearing this truth, Elma had become so distraught that she had taken off through the night and thrown herself in utter despair down the well. They picked apart every single man in her life and even introduced the fact she could have been an opioid user and may have made her way down the well in the dark in a drugged state. The public were outraged. After a two-day trial, the judge then stepped in to ensure the verdict was a swift one. He stopped short of actually telling them what to say, but let's just say that within five minutes, the brother of a famous builder of New York City was acquitted. The public was completely outraged that a young woman was seduced, used, and discarded, and the wealthy, powerful criminal got to walk free. She may have been a gold digger, but Elma did not receive a fair trial which explains the rage her family must have felt. Around this time in our history, you could get sent to prison for simply owing money, let alone any other serious crimes. So the fact that only after two days, Levi's incredibly clever lawyers had succeeded in a way that had never been done before. This type of clever lawyering was very new to the courtroom. After the trial, Levi escaped the city as fast as he could, or he may have been run out of town. He eventually settled in Natchez, Mississippi, and by all accounts carried on his building life to become a successful builder and businessman. Now, the story does not end here. It moves into a tragic haunting at the well that is still felt to this present day. The Elma Sands tale was used to warn young women about the dangers of men and going out at night. Her tragic end cast a dark shadow on this area of New York. The well was not used again as a water source after the murder and in 1817 a house was built around it. Since then, there has always been a presence. Activity at 129 Spring Street is not just isolated to this one well. There were many crimes committed in this area over time, and the spirits can make themselves known. You may hear voices as you walk along the old cobblestones. In 1895, an American magazine was quoted saying, young men and maidens who pass the spot late at night testify they can hear Elma scream as she vainly implores her lover for her life. Reports of screams or crying have persisted over the years. As the building has changed hands many times, the well was eventually sealed up and was encased in the basement of the building. In 1950, the Manhattan Bistro opened. The family knew a bit about the history of the area, but from then on there was constant missing silverware or cold spots in the building. Elma's restless spirit was acknowledged to be in the building. In the 1980s, when they renovated the basement and uncovered the well, the paranormal activity went up a notch. Once the well was open, all manner of things would go missing. Plates and other items, broken or thrown. Not to mention the voices that were heard. If you were brave enough to visit the basement, you could see a swirling mist. In 2014, the bistro closed but it soon became home to COS Clothing, and they embraced the history and everything to do with the story of Elma. In 2014, Martin Anderson, the head of men's design for the company, joked, We imagine it being dressed in all white, a modern minimalist ghost. Power surges and missing inventory, but no one would ever evict her from the place. Next time you're walking and notice the old cobblestones, wrought iron gates, and voices you can't quite make out, Remember the other souls that once walked the streets with dreams, just as you do now. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.